That is literally scripture in song, straight from the Psalms. Better is one day in the courts of God than thousands elsewhere. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You can be seated. And what a joy and a delight to be with you today. It's just a true joy to be with you today. If you don't know who I am, some of you are new here. Uh, my name is John Felsman. As a matter of fact, I had the honor and privilege for just shy of 12 years to be on the pastoral staff here at All Nations Church. And a delight to be with you this morning. And back in, I got a, I got a little phone call and a text message on Thursday morning from Pastor Sean. And he said, I got no voice. He said, could you speak for me on Sunday? And so I said, I'll do my best. So we're, we're praying for Pastor Sean right now. I know he's, he's uh, silently rejoicing because he doesn't have much of a voice right now because his Edmonton Oilers did pretty well last night and got into the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, where's my Leaf Nation, people? 19 years since we have passed the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, I don't know about you, but I am going to be on pins and needles later tonight for that Boston-Florida game, hoping and praying that Florida somehow pulls it out, because I think we have a better chance of beating Florida than we may have beating the Boston Bruins. They've held us back for a long time, but let's go Leafs! Come on! There's a guy with a shirt right there. All right. Leafs Nation, we're back in. Isn't that fun? Isn't, isn't that such a delight to see that? And of course, the most important thing today is that this is our Volunteer Appreciation Sunday. A hand for our volunteers, those of you who serve this church and do so well at making not only this place happen, but making God's name great throughout our community and throughout our world. That is what the mission of this church is, has always been and still is today. All Nations Church, if you know it, recite it with me, exists to help you know the Lord Jesus Christ grow spiritually, and go make a difference in our world. That's the, that is our statement. That is our statement that we stand firm on, and it is still true to this day. I'm going to take you back. Anybody here remember the year 1971? Now that was, I'll be honest, that was, Alice, you're not that old. Come on now. You're younger than I am, and I was, I'm 10 years too, too young for that. I was born in 81. In the year 1971, the pastor at my home church, because I'm from Perry Sound, a lot of you know that, the Perry Sound Pentecostal Church, Pastor David Shepherd, who would later become kind of our bishop in the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada for the Western Ontario District, was our young pastor. And God put a vision in his heart to do services at Kilbear Park. Anybody been to Kilbear Park and camped over the years? The gorgeous Kilbear Point and the beach and that. Well, the big provincial park's been there a long time, and they got a wonderful amphitheater. And God really put it on Pastor Shepherd's heart to do services there. And so he approached the warden of Kilbear Park and he asked, and he said to the warden, warden, can we do services there on Sundays in the summertime? And the war warden kept turning him down. There was conversation after conversation, but no, there was no way this was ever going to happen, that there was going to be church services happening at this provincial park because they, they were afraid, oh, well, it would be too offensive to people or people might put some pressure up against the warden and that kind of thing. And so there was no way that this was going to happen. Well, Pastor Shepard decided to call my grandfather, Ralph Felsman, one day and came up with this crazy idea. And when I mean say crazy idea, I mean a really crazy idea. In the 1950s, one of the years in the 1950s, my grandfather attempted very unsuccessfully uh, to be a commercial fisherman. We had a few uh, people in our church that were commercial fishermen, so grandpa got himself this old wooden boat and he decided to try it. And dad said the year they did it, they nearly starved to death. <laughs> well, that boat wound up in dry dock over the years and they called it the Sea Queen. That was what its name was. So somehow, Pastor Shepard convinced my grandpa to bring the Sea Queen back, to resurrect the Sea Queen, patch the holes in it, and they put a bunch of people on board the Sea Queen, and they decided to drive that old boat, that old relic, out to Kilbear Point and preach to everybody on the beach. There's a picture of it right there. So it was renamed from the Sea Queen to the Cruising for Christ boat. On its way to Kilbear Park. That's from our church history book, and I found it. They spelled Kilbear wrong as two L's, but that's okay. That's quite, that's quite all right. And uh, it looks like there's a stand-up bass there and a few people and probably more accordions than you could shake a stick at. <laughs> well, that was the style then. And so anyways, on a Sunday afternoon after church, they went out. They aborted the old Sea Queen after working on it for a couple of weeks, taking the caulking guns out, patching the holes, and away it went. 
and they preached to everybody on the beach on a beautiful summer Sunday afternoon at Kilbear. Well, Monday morning, the telephone rings at the church office. And Pastor Shepard, first thing in the morning, gets this phone call, and it's from a very frantic warden at Kilbear Park. And the warden said, all right, preacher, you win. You win. You can have services at Kilbear Park in the amphitheater on one condition that I never see that piece of junk wooden boat ever across Kilbear Point ever again. So I tell you that kind of crazy and semi-humorous story because what that started in 1971 was a 35-year ministry. 35 years every Sunday, July and August, folks from our church got together, went out to Kilbear Park and did services. Kind of an ecumenical service for multi-denominations across the board. But I can tell you that not only was the Word of God preached, testimonies and stories were given, lives were touched, people found Jesus. I remember playing, cutting my teeth as a young musician um, uh, at Kilbear Park, and I remember seeing sometimes six, seven hundred people show up and pack that amphitheater. It was unbelievable. It was two or three times bigger than the church we attended. But it was a great ministry, and for 35 years, God used that, and God used the stories of people, the testimonies, and the Word of God to change lives. And because all because somebody decided to, you know, get in the boat this time instead of step out of the boat and try something a little different. But for 35 successful years, that went out, and that did a really great work. I know all of us in this room, anybody that's ever taken the opportunity to serve in some way, shape, or form, or in some capacity, you know the blessing that it is. And you can't help but feel good when you serve. Now, it's not always easy, is it? Serving sometimes comes at a personal sacrifice. It comes at your time sometimes. It bites away at some of those things. But I can tell you that the sacrifice that you give, and I am proof in the pudding of this, the sacrifice that you give sometimes, the hours that it takes, is so worth the benefit of the rewards and the reward of knowing, most importantly, that lives are touched, that someone's heart has changed because we stepped out and we did something really cool. One of the things I love about this church, I've been to lots of churches over the years. I've attended lots of them. I've been a guest at a lot of them. I've worked in several of them, even before the 12 wonderful years I had here. And I can tell you, this is the warmest, most welcoming church ever. You see that, and that's because of you. Your smiling faces make such an incredible difference in this place. And I hear it over and over again, even today. I hear it a ton of times, that how you know, their burdens are just lifted when they walk through the doors here. They see the smile, and they see the warmth of your care, friends. And that makes such a grand difference in the lives of someone that's going through hard times. The church is supposed to be a lighthouse. The church is supposed to be a place of refuge. And that is what we are. And when you bring yourself here and when you put yourself out there and serve in such a way, and it doesn't even have to be a big, huge, necessarily a grandiose way. However you serve, you make a difference. You make this place better. And you make yourself better. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today as we explore some of the scripture today. So today, there's a few things and a few points I want you to take home with you today. And we ask, what, God, what does God say about serving? God in the Bible says a lot about serving and talks about the importance of it and the value of it. You know, on this Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, we have so much to talk about when it comes to serving. But I want you to first choose three things. There's three things I need you to choose today. And see, that's at the end of the day, you have choices. You have choices how you live your life. And you have choices, you know, with some of the things that you can do. And there's lots of great things you can do. We have lots of opportunities at a place like this to serve and to make a difference in not only our church, but in the community around us. The first thing I want you to choose is God's purpose. God has a purpose. God has a purpose and a plan for each, every one of us here in this place today and beyond. But we have to choose God's purpose. We can choose not to operate in it, but it's important that we choose God's purpose. God's purpose in your life, let me tell you, is fulfilled through serving, and I'm a testimony to that. You were made with a very specific design in mind, a specific purpose, and a specific ministry that God has planned for you, that only you can really make a grand difference in. Who knows you better than your creator, right? When you think about it, who really knows you better than the one that made you, the one that knits you together, as the Bible says, in your mother's womb? Nobody does. Nobody knows you better. You and I are, as the Bible says, fearfully and wonderfully made. 
You may not think that about yourself. Maybe your self-esteem is not really where it should be. But you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were crafted by the Creator Himself, and He has put a purpose in your life to do amazing things. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says these words, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When you go to the Greek, the word workmanship really translates into the term work of art. And when you think of a work of art, really the big translation of that is masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Now, I don't know about you, but when I wake up first thing in the morning and I look in the mirror, I don't see God's masterpiece, <laughs> right? It takes a bit of doing, you know, just, you know, you got to clean yourself up and that kind of thing. But, you know, we don't often see that. And, and the sad thing is, is that even when we've cleaned ourselves up, maybe get ourselves ready for the work day or whatever the day brings us, we don't see that in ourselves. But that is the first promise and the first purpose we have to understand is that we are God's masterpiece. He's created us in Christ Jesus to do good works and to bless the community and the world around us. So just as you are, just the way you are, you are God's work of art, a literal work of art. And nobody else knows you better and knows your true calling and your true purpose than the designer, than the artist himself, which is our Father God. And even the people closest to you don't necessarily, even if they know you pretty well, they don't necessarily know that full potential and full design or your full purpose or the destiny. But we know there is a positive destiny. There is a work for each one of us to do. And it is in the plan and very purposes of God himself that tell us exactly who we are and what he has planned for us to do. And each of us here has to remember that we are designed to impact and we are designed to make a difference. And that's been planned for us since the beginning of time itself. And God's purpose will bring you abundance to your life and more than your own purposes. Abundance. That abundance means more. That's what abundant means. It means more. More than you can ever ask or imagine. So choose more today. Choose God's purpose. The second thing I want you to choose today is God's provision. God provides. Anybody experience that in your life? God has provided for you in a way that you never thought possible. Well, God has provided, and we need to choose that provision and the path that God lays in front of us, and also choose to embrace the gifts that God has given each and every one of us, because we're all gifted uniquely. We're gifted differently, but we're all gifted in some way, and we have a real talent and a, and a real group of skills that we can share together. I want you to read this scripture with me. We can read it out loud. It's going to come up on the screen. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse 17, this comes from the message version of the Bible. Read this with me. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches that we could ever manage to do good, to be rich in helping others to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Okay, that line is so key, that last line. Embracing the life that is truly life. If you're not serving at your full capacity, if you're not embracing the gifts that God has planted in your life, you're choosing less. Did you ever think about that? I'm telling you right now, you are choosing less than what you were designed for. You're choosing less blessing. You're choosing, let me tell you, you're choosing less fun. You are choosing less fun. And you are choosing to, you know, walk more in the mediocre than in the blessing of God. That's embracing the life that is truly life. The life that is truly life is when we're living in such a way that we are designed for, that we are gifted at, and believe me, it becomes easy for you to embrace that over time, as you see the gift that God develops in you and continue to grow and continue to increase, it becomes like second nature to you. And that's the most important thing. Choose that provision. God has put, provided you and I with that, that very set of gifts and that set of skills that is going to make a difference somewhere in, in this church and somewhere in this community. But that's what we need to choose is God's provision. Choosing God's purpose is important. But choosing the skills that God has provided with you is also important. And the third thing I want you to choose is God's promises. 
Because God has promised us an awful lot. The promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and so be it. They are with us and the promises are all over scripture. But the promise I want to focus on today is the promise of joy. There is joy. When I was in Sunday school as a kid, uh, we used to sing this little chorus. And joy was the word of the, of the chorus, in the chorus, but it was an acronym. And it went like this, Jesus and others and you is a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you. And it went in that order, and that order is very specific. When we choose the call of Jesus in our lives, we also choose the mission that is to spread the gospel and to be lights in a dark place. And that is what we have. The hope of our faith is a light in the darkness, which helps us embrace others. And then we put ourselves last and spell joy. But joy, that is the promise of God that I want you to embrace today. There are so many promises in your life, but promising the promise of joy is very, very important. You know, if you decide in your life not to run in such a way or embrace the gifts that God has given you, embrace the provision and embrace the purpose, you're robbing yourself. Did you ever think about that? You're robbing yourself of the joy that God will give you for operating the way you're supposed to operate, for operating in the gifts that you have, for finding, you know, you got to find that joy. That joy only comes by embracing everything about who you are, and it's about living more. We talked about that word abundant, having more and being more than we even see in ourselves. Romans 8, 28, a lot of you know this from memory, but it's a good scripture to hang on to. And we know that for those, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And if you're not living out that purpose today, friends, exercising the gifts that God has implanted and put in your heart from the very beginning, you are just choosing less. And that's a choice. You know, God predestined us even before we were born. God knew the type of person you were going to be. God knew your personalities. God knew the giftings that he was going to implant in your life. But God also granted that other gift of free will. There's a predestination and a predesign for us. But if we decide in our free will not to operate in that, you're choosing less. It's kind of like putting diesel in a gasoline engine. What happens? She don't run too good. Think about that. It doesn't. It might run. It'll spit and sput and it won't be healthy. It won't get you down the road very far. But that's the thing. It's almost like doing that. It's almost like choosing to put yourself through less or not putting the right fuel inside of your body. And when that happens, you are choosing less and you are not able even physically to do some of the things that God has planned for you. So we got to make sure that we are choosing that joy because the joy comes in serving. Colossians 3 verse 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward for you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the greatest joy. I tell you, um, most of you know, or a lot of you know that I'm a musician. And so my gift in life really, as far as the physical is concerned, has been music. God put that in my heart many years ago as a teenager and developed that over time. And I cut my teeth at my home church playing and and, uh, in the background. They used to let me play the Hammond organ in the background because it had a volume pedal on it because I could hide if I was going to mess up, you know. That's what they did. I cut my teeth on a little Hammond and over time, then, then uh, the lead pianist was out of town one Sunday, and they said, you're on. And I'm like, I was so scared. And I know most of you would look and go, come on. No, but literally, it, it didn't come overnight. Any gift that I have developed over time, not only through the gifting that God had, but over the working out of that gift, the practice, the experience, the getting up and doing it, the trying hard, the getting over the nerves and the beads of sweat and all the things. But over time... That actually gave me a career for a number of years because I was able to serve. But that's what it is. And today, I have a different career. I work somewhere else, so my my actual money comes from another job. But it is an honor to serve this place and to be back here to serve. That's what it's about because really, that's where it all started. And so it is cyclical. It keeps happening. And it's a joy for me to serve in this capacity and to still help out where I can and in the times I can. Because you know what? God puts that gift in you, and the gift is not supposed to be wasted. It doesn't go away. It's not there for a season. It is there for life. And the calling on your heart is there for life. If there's breath in your body, as it was said to me one time, there's still purpose and there's hope. And there's a gift for you to share. So you've got to make sure that you're giving it. So don't let the enemy steal your joy. 
Don't let the enemy steal your joy. If you're feeling like you're in a place today where, ah, I can't do that, that's the enemy. That's the enemy telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough, or that you're not equipped enough to do this. And believe me, whatever that is, God has planted a vision in your heart, and there's something maybe deep in your craw, as it were, that might be bothering you, or that might be saying to you, oh boy, if, if only we could do this, or if only this could happen. Let me tell you, if God's putting that on your heart, if you're thinking, if only this could happen, that means you're supposed to lead it. All right? Don't go to the pastor and say, well, you know, pastor, I think this would just revolutionize that because he's going to look at you and say, okay, you're in charge. <laughs> it's true. It's true. If it's on your heart and it's a burden, God will make the way where there seems to be no way. God will take that thing that looks like a big obstacle or a big fence and he'll carve open the path in that fence and make something happen that you think is absolutely impossible. I've known it true in my life. It's been true in my life in the last week. I can tell you that. God will make the way. If it's supposed to happen and it's on your heart, God will make the way. But I also want you to think about this too. Sometimes when it comes to serving, and musicians struggle with this, artists do all the time, we struggle a little bit with pride, you know? We do. Because there, there's an ego involved. I don't care how you slice it, but there is an ego involved in there too. And let me tell you, there's nothing more embarrassing than making a mistake. I had to learn early on, and I thank my music teacher from high school who taught us about jazz. He says, if you make a mistake in jazz, and the next eight bars make the same mistake again, everybody will think it was on purpose. They, well, it's jazz. <laughs> But that's, sometimes that's part of it. But the, you, you know, the face goes just red. And I've been there. And you're like, oh, no. And you beat yourself up or whatever the case may be. But it's important for us to examine our heart and also make sure that we are in it for the right reason and never lose sight of the importance of it. That really, whatever talent we have, it is a gift from God. God breathed that into your life. And it is God's. And it is God's that we need to give back and serve with. So we never need to forget that. I've been reading a little bit of C.S. Lewis lately, getting back into some great stuff. And I was uh, browsing through his book, The Problem of Pain. And I came across this line, and it just captivated me. And it goes like this. For you will certainly carry out God's purpose, however you act. But it makes a difference to you, whether you serve like a Judas or serve like a John. Think about that for a minute. Are we in it for the pride? Are we in it for the 30 pieces of silver? Or are we in it for the joy of serving God because we love one another? John was the beloved disciple, right? And Judas was, of course, the one that sold him out at the end of it. Now, that was all part of a purpose and plan, and we understand that. But that talks to us about the attitude of our heart and where we're at. So how are you serving today? Are you serving out of your own motivation or out of your own convenience? Or are you serving for God? Are you sacrificing? Are you stepping out even though there seems to be obstacles in your way? Are you stepping out? And is God making a path through that obstacle? Because I'm going to tell you right now, He will. You know, when I think about being a musician, for the longest time, I couldn't think about, you know, looking down from my hands and wondering what my hands were doing. If I, if I looked up so much for a split second to see what the worship leader was going to do, I'd lose my place. Over time, as that, that gift developed and exercised, then, you know, suddenly I could do that. I could look up and, okay, things could keep going here and the train wasn't going to fall off the proverbial tracks. And then somebody said to me, they said, well, you need to lead worship, you need to sing. And I said, I can't do that. There's no way. I couldn't sing and play something at the same time because those are two very different wavelengths, let me tell you. But tried it over time, looking at my hands, trying to sing in a microphone, chasing it, you know, like it's just embarrassing. But over time... It becomes a natural to you. Over time, you learn that skill set, and over time, it gets easier, and it gets easier. It's no different than joining any one of our teams here. Maybe you think to yourself, well, maybe I can start out by serving coffee. Go learn that espresso machine. I don't know how to do that. Anybody know how to do that? Learn some recipes. Do a few things. Next thing you know, you'll be a gourmet. You'll be a whiz. It's no different than trying a recipe. I'm a terrible cook, right? Yeah, I'm terrible. <laughs> Not much of a cook at all. But, and I have this recipe that I like that my mom made one time, and it's this spicy sausage pasta thing. And I said, Mom, give me the recipe. And this was a few years ago. So she emailed me the recipe. She goes, I got this from one of our friends back home, but she goes, I modified it. I don't make it this way. And so she kind of told me how she modified it. I think I've made that thing seven or eight times, and all seven or eight times is a little bit different. 
And then, depending on who you're feeding it to, well, I don't like spicy things. So next thing, you're changing the sausage, and you're changing, you know what I mean? But over time, the, the last two times I've made it, it's turned out perfect. It's turned out like mom's. I'm like, okay, but, but there's a science to it. And there's trying different things. There's reducing certain things. And, and some, sometimes you have to look at your life as the same thing. You have to look at your life and realize there's some things that are in the way. And some of the obstacles that we talked about earlier, you put in the way. And sometimes you have to remove those obstacles or maybe quit doing something so you can start doing something that's more worthwhile and start doing something that's going to bring a lot more blessing to your life than pain. So we have to learn what those things are and we have to examine those things very, very carefully. So stop settling for less, friends, than our Savior has designed us for. So I want you to examine your heart today. I want you to really think, and I want you to examine the heart of yours today. I want you to ask yourself, what am I designed for? Really ask yourself the basic question, who am I? Who am I in Christ, but who am I? What does God want me to do? What's God given me that I can do? And pray, ask for God's direction as to what he would have you do. You know, I go back to that story about the crazy guys in the boat that would go out and preach at Kilbear Park and how that crazy act, which seemed like a real long shot, started a 35-year ministry. But let me tell you the detriment of the 35-year ministry, and the detriment I see to it is this, is that it had 35 wonderful years and God did some great things. But let me tell you something, that 35 years could still be happening today. It ended in 2006. That could be still getting into 50 years today. And you don't want to know the biggest reason why? And I'll tell you the biggest reason why. The same six people that went out on that first Sunday, the same six people that went out when they got permission to go to the park, loaded up a sound system week in, week out, loaded up an old Fender Rhodes suitcase 88 piano, they're heavier than lead, let me tell you. The same six people kept doing it for 35 years, but on the 35th year, the same six people were still the same six, six people doing it. They didn't grow the ministry beyond themselves. They could do it. They knew what they were doing. And yeah, maybe in a lot of ways it got easy, pretty slick. But let me tell you, when you age after 35 years, that same PA system they used for 35 years wasn't getting any lighter. Some of that same gear that was happening was starting to fall over a little bit. But most importantly, they didn't pass it on. They didn't train other people. They didn't get other people involved with it. And so let's look at All Nations Church for a second. There's a little story about something that was a fight to get some 35, 36 years ago, and that's a thing called living nativity. Yeah. Think about living nativity for a minute. Yeah. How many lives has living nativity impacted over the years? But for those of you that were around in the early 80s, and remember the publicity, the publicity was negative for a while. The publicity in the papers, how dare we put a religious thing at a science center? How dare we step out and do something like that? And the press it got and it only drove that thing to happen. But let me tell you something. A lot of our key people that run Living Nativity, and God bless you guys for so many years of service, if some of us younger ones aren't stepping up and helping and taking over some of those roles, Living Nativity will have a lifespan and it will end unless we keep it going. Unless we find the burden in our hearts. And some, somewhere, and somewhere in this room, I know there's some people you know, that would give and sacrifice, you know, it's five nights of the year. And yeah, I know we have all the things that we could talk about, the inconvenience. Well, it's Christmas and it's a busy time. I know it's a busy time, but lives are touched. And how many people have come to this church because of living nativity over the years? So that's important. God may be putting that, the very thing on your heart, maybe to step in and take over that role. And we revamped it and retooled it a little bit this year to fit a little bit more of a modern audience. And I'm sure it'll be revamped and retooled again. It can be. It doesn't have to die, but the biggest reason that something dies is because an awful lot of times it's not passed on to the next person. People aren't mentored to getting in there. So I'm going to encourage you right now, you need to talk to some people. Help us keep this thing going because the fight that it took to get it, it survived COVID coming here for a year and we got it back there. Because let me tell you, if you think it was hard in the 1980s, if we quit doing that in this modern culture, it may be even harder, let alone impossible to get a religious thing at a science center. Remember the victory that it took. Remember some crazy guys on a sea queen that went out with a bunch of accordion players and singing and preaching the word of God changed lives later and changed lives for the better. 
It's a great story, and I don't remember the gentleman's name because he had passed away just before I started working at this church. But uh, I remember when I first came to work here, and Pastor Jeremy told me that we do Christmas Day service here, and I thought to myself, well, that's inconvenient. <laughs> you know? I said to myself, that's inconvenient. You got to get the worship team together. Just over rehearsal Christmas morning. We got to do a Christmas morning. Say, Jeremy, everywhere else I've been, we do a Christmas Eve thing. Go enjoy our family. No, we do a Christmas Day service. And I'm thinking, why in the name would we do this? It's, it's so inconvenient. And then I heard the story behind it. The very first Christmas morning service they decided to do when we were still over at 885 Fleet Street, the worship team came together and they were rehearsing. And I guess it was warm. I guess you know, maybe we had the hot water over there and, and the rads, and it could get warm in there. I remember some winter days opening the windows in the auditorium to let the place air out when we had rehearsal nights. And they did that. And there was a gentleman in one of the adjacent parking lots and living in one of the adjacent apartment buildings, you remember, at the top of the hill. And he was fastening some duct tape to a dryer vent hose to the end of his tailpipe. And he was working it over to the window of his car. He decided he'd had enough. He decided whatever was going on in his life, because I can't speak to it, I wasn't there, but he decided to end his life. And somehow in the midst of that, taping up that dryer vent line to that exhaust pipe of that car, somebody had opened the windows there and he heard some Christmas carols. That gentleman left his car, wandered over, and stayed for church. And matter of fact, volunteered in our church for a number of years, didn't he, Gene and Eileen? Volunteered for a number of years and died of natural causes many years later. God brought the joy of serving because we sacrificed and we did something pretty cool. We did something inconvenient that made a difference. So you never know the circumstance. Something may seem to be a pain for you today or something may seem to be, oh man, can we really do that? Or should we do that? Or I don't feel like doing it today. Well, a bunch of people that maybe even didn't feel like doing it that day saved a life. And not only saved a life in the physical, brought a life to Jesus Christ and created a servant's heart out of somebody and made a difference in All Nations Church and made a difference in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada because they served, because they stepped out. So today, friends, on this Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, on this Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, don't forget what it is to serve. And don't forget... That even if you feel like you don't have much to give, even if you feel like you're not really qualified to do something, you are overqualified. I'm going to read you one quick story, and then I'm going to wrap up, and I'm going to get the worship team to join me right now, if you would. There was a man named Edward Kimball. He was concerned about one of his young Sunday school students who worked at a shoe store in his town. One day, Mr. Kimball visited him at the store, and he found the student in the back stocking some shoes. And he led him to Christ right then and there in the stock room of the shoe store. That little shoe salesman, that young teenager, was named Dwight L. Moody. D.L. Moody eventually left that shoe store to become one of the most greatest preachers and one of the greatest evangelists of modern times. And Moody, of course, whose international speaking took him to the British Isles from America, preached in a little chapel pastored by a young man with the imposing name of Frederick Brotherton Mayer. And in his sermon, Moody told an emotionally charged story about a Sunday school teacher he had known in Chicago who personally went to every student in his class and led each one of them to Christ individually. That message changed Pastor Mayer's entire ministry, inspiring him to become an evangelist much like D.L. Moody. And over the years, Mayer would come to America from England several times to preach, once in Northfield, Massachusetts, where a young, confused preacher sitting in the back row heard Mayer say, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ... Are you willing to be made willing? There's a question today. Are you willing to be made willing? That remark would lead one J. Wilbur Chapman to respond to the call of God in his life. And Chapman went on to become one of the most effective evangelists of his time. A volunteer by the name of Billy Sunday, who helped set up crusades and evangelistic crusades, learned how to preach by watching Chapman. And Billy Sunday eventually would take over Chapman's full ministry, becoming one of the most dynamic evangelists of the early 20th century. He preached in many of the great arenas around the nation. And Billy Sunday's preaching turned thousands of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the story doesn't end there. Inspired by a 1924 Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, a committee of Christians there dedicated themselves to reaching Charlotte for Jesus Christ. The committee invited the evangelist Mordecai Ham 
to hold a series of evangelistic meetings in the year 1932, right at the, at the dawn of the Depression. A very lanky 16-year-old would sit in this huge crowd one evening, spellbound by the message of this white-haired preacher who seemed to be shouting and waving his lone finger at him. Night after night, that teenager attended and finally went forward and responded to give his life to Christ. Do you know what the teenager's name was? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. No human being on this earth has had the evangelistic and reach that Billy Graham has had thanks to the changing technology of television and radio over the years. No one is, in a physical sense has reached more people for Christ than Billy Graham. But it started out with someone you don't even know about and never heard about, a nobody named Kimball. So you may think to yourself, you're a nobody named whatever your name is, whatever your name is today. But God can use you to plant a seed that will one day change the world. It'll change the world. So friends, where do we take it from here? I want you to read your blueprints when you go home. Get your manual out. It's your life's manual. Look inside your heart. Know your blueprints. Take on a role of self-discovery. Know yourself. Well, you know yourself well, but challenge and find out what God has for you. And you may even find out that you fit into something better than you think you do. But think of where you fit because we all fit. So read your blueprints. Secondly, read your heart. Be reminded of those things that you're passionate about. Be reminded of the gifts that God has placed in your heart. And you know what? Get a pen and paper out. Start making a list of things that you do well and think about how those skills might benefit the kingdom of God because they can, let me tell you. They can make a huge difference. And thirdly and most importantly, read your Bible. Read God's word. I'll close with this scripture today from Joshua chapter 22. After all those years in the desert, the Israelites wandering and finally getting that clear direction and being led into the promised land. And right when they were on the cusp of that, getting led into their grand and glorious future after years of slavery, years of captivity, and years of wandering around in the same circle over and over again. These precious words. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. To love the Lord your God. To walk in obedience to Him. Keep His commands to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And everybody said, amen. amen. God.